is Stuart Pankin. Stuart! Ricky! I'm so happy you're here. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, what a pleasure. What a pleasure. Thanks for yeah. asking. It, it, you know, I was so excited. I went over to wish Gregory Harrison a happy birthday. And you had uh, commented, you, you had liked whatever or whatever it was that I wrote. And, um, and I thought, Stuart Pankin. And I immediately knew, you know, for me, not necessarily the news. I mean, that that's where you came into my life. Yeah. Um, is that is that what you get? Do you get that? I mean, we have to be a little seasoned to know that. But yeah, do you still like, get that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, um, uh, it was a it was a game changer for me. And uh, oh. and people still uh, know and reference the show and keep saying, why don't you do it again? Why don't you do it again? Well, there's a lot of reasons, technical and others that we can't. But uh, yeah, not necessarily the news that changed my life. Okay, wait, Stuart. Oh, yes, we are. Okay, I was going to stop you because I didn't see us, but I do. Sure. I bet, I okay. bet, oh, see, look at this. So I bet it. Look here. Look at what's going Stuart. on. Oh, Nothing yes, but we... professional here. Um, when you, okay, so I know you were, before we get to, to not necessarily the news, I have to find out how you got there. So I know you were born, raised in Philly. Is that the deal? That's correct. And so was it school plays? Were, were you the class clown? What was your deal in school? No, I, <laughs> I got more trouble than, than, than <laughs> clowning. Uh, the, I always, if you want to go back that far, I've always knew that I wanted to, to, to sort of, you know, ham it up. I used to, in family dinners, I used to do stuff. I don't remember what, but I know I liked to being in front of people. And then were when your I got- family to, show busy people? No. Well, no. My uncle, Tom Brotherton, was actually a very- well-known in the business, treasurer of the Alvin. He was asked by Florence Ziegfeld to come to manage the, the, the Follies when he was in Philadelphia. He started in Philadelphia and he was asked by Ziegfeld to manage the Follies. He's a great yeah. treasurer. But that's, yeah, that, that's, that's something that's, uh, that I'm, I'm happy for him. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> but uh, but he, uh, that's the only real showbiz connection. Because when I was young, and going to school, I was, you know, struggling like everybody. And in high school, when I even, the little tickle of, of acting bug, you know, started to crawl around in me, the, the, uh, the auditorium collapsed. There was no, in high school, the auditorium, the, not the gym, the auditorium collapsed. We had no auditorium for, for years when I was in school. So there was no theater. There was no, you wow. know, I, I, did, I think I did, I remember doing a Chekhov short one act in the library, you know, in the in the cafeteria with a couple of people. So I knew the 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 itch was in me. Right. Not until I got to college, and I was going to be a psychology major. I signed up to be a psychology major in college because I I liked it so much in high school. But you know, when that audition call came out, and as I say, walked across that cold, scary, lonely campus to to audition for uh, for the first play at Dickinson. Uh, I was hooked. I was do you hooked. remember what the play was? Of course oh, you do. Yeah. yeah, it was Our Town. It oh. was the first play in the, in a new theater designed by somebody very famous, and I don't remember. But uh, okay. it was the absolute first play in that new theater, the Mathers Theater. And uh, I, I, I moved furniture. You know, I carried benches and, and was, a, was, a, was, a, was an extra, whatever, you know. Uh, but, I, you know, I met my teacher, who later became my friend and mentor Dave Bubaker, and I was, I was hooked. I mean, that, that, that. I, did, I what did you that. get cast in in our town? In our town? What, what was your I, I, I moved furniture. I was a, I was a town. You, you were a townsperson. Yeah, and there, there was no small actors only. There are no small roles, only small actors, right? Only short actors. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my, my, uh, there was no drama major uh, in my college when I was there. There were five co courses. And eventually I took four of them because the, Dave said, uh, you know, you're acting. I acted in everything I could. So he said, you don't have to take the acting class. And my friend Bernie said, there's no drama. Major. He says, well, the proper major for a drama person is English in that particular situation. I became an English major. Uh, oh. Now, of course, there's, an, in, there's English, there's drama majors in every college in the country, in the world. Right. But uh, I didn't. And maybe that was a good thing. You know, maybe that was a, a good thing that I wasn't so immersed in the in the mystique of the theater so I had to learn it slowly as I as I went through life did you study all through did you continue to study Pat I know you went to graduate school we'll talk about that but did you continue to study acting through your career your early career 
just just graduate school one from co- from college to graduate school and that was Columbia hello Columbia, yeah. hello it was <laughs> uh, it, it was great for a lot of reasons uh, it was great teachers there were some great teachers there <laughs> teachers used to tell us well you're all hotshot college actors aren't you <laughs> he said well, well we'll change that you know but they they taught us technique dance you know I, Robert Neff Williams who was one of the greatest voice teachers in New York at the time was our teacher. He was spectacular. He was, he was, you know, and a lot, most of the teachers were, were, you know, it was revelatory for me because I never studied acting like that. I'd only done plays, you know, right. I never studied it. So they taught you movement and, 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 and dance. You could, if you could believe it and vocal stuff to, and showed you the difference. And it was- Did you have singing as well? Cause you, I was saying before yes. we went up live, yes, you're amazing. Well, thank you. Well, no, yes, you there are. Was a, there was a, there's a, a couple of teachers. Marie Champeau was my voice teacher at Columbia. And we went down to this place in, you know, midtown Manhattan. And we studied, you know, singing. I don't know if it helped me or not, but, uh, you know, I, I did it. And I, I love singing. I mean, I just, I just love it. You have a, le- you have a legit stage voice, which is, you know, that's, that takes, that takes work. Well, yeah. I mean, I've done a bunch of musicals and, and enjoyed doing it. A lot of mostly a lot of character stuff, you know, I, it's not I didn't play, you know, Pagliacci, but I, I you know, I played a, a lot of things in a lot of different musicals and, you know, not to beat a dead uh, uh, larynx, but I enjoy I mean, I really uh, I really enjoyed the singing and, and the process of it. as a Have hobby. You... I, I, go go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. I said as a hobby, I do song parodies. I, I, I take music from other things and I write lyrics to, to, to songs and I sing them for friends or in events or people are leaving town. You know, I enjoy doing that. Like these, uh, I'm sure you'll talk about these uh, fundraising things. That I, I was just going to say, I as soon as, uh, did I tell the story? Of, yeah, about Gregory Harrison. And you were on Trapper John, correct? Is that how you know Gregory? Yeah, that's one of the reasons. We also did a play together, a reading a couple for a couple of nights up in uh, Ventura. Yeah, he's a great guy. But Trapper he's John, a- yeah, that's what I meant. Wonderful guys. So yes, yeah, so I met you there and then I immediately went to your Facebook page and I was like, oh my God, Stuart Penkin. And, and then there was this wonderful song and dance uh, whole routine from a, from a high school fundraiser, which right. is fantastic that you do to begin with. But then you did bits from, um, what did you do? Where would you be with that? I can't remember what, what you did, but- well, there I, was, Yeah, there was two of them. One one uh, was the first one. We did three of them, Kreppel and I, Paul Kreppel. <laughs> Uh, the first one was we started out where would you be with that and then it turned into a parody of uh, do you love me uh, because we've known each other for such a long time and then we did another one which was a food medley I've lost 95 pounds and and we decided to do a medley of food parodying food <laughs> celery people who love celery <laughs> are the lo- you know that kind of stuff but it goes on and on so that's what we did uh, for the Hamilton High School uh, uh, musical department because I had a lot of friends who had kids at Hamilton and I was happy to do it through. That's so wonderful. Well, speaking of kids and family, so you've been married for 47 years, which is absolutely crazy to me. Um, what? And, and, <laughs> you, <laughs> and you met Joy, how did you meet Joy? At Columbia, at Columbia, at the graduate program. Uh, we were, we were uh, I don't know what they call them, freshmen first years at Columbia. Yeah. And as soon as I saw her, I said to myself, you know, I, this woman is, uh, she's for me. And uh, I pursued her. And I finally, after three years, you know, got her to go out with me. It's tough to, it's tough to, to, I don't know. Well, maybe I'm wrong. It's either tough or not tough to become per- really personal with somebody that you see every day, you know, five days a week sweating in, 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 in workout clothes, you know, and, and, and watching you succeed and fail in classes. It's, it's, it, some people might say it's tough to, to, to get by that and to get into a, into a personal relationship. But I knew, I knew. I told a, a mutual friend of mine, I said, you know, I'm going to marry that, that girl. How, really? How soon yeah. did you say that? Pretty not soon. That, not, yeah, last night I said it. To, <laughs> well, I guess I said in my second year, you know, maybe at the end of the first year, I just knew it. There was something about it that, and still is. It's just wonderful. She just swell. Now, did she know, did she, It's you said it took you three years to get her, but did she, did she later confess that she knew too, or did she not know? 
No, uh, I, I I don't know if she was put off by me, you know, you know, staring <laughs> at her, you know, <laughs> five, 15 hours a day. Uh, I, I don't think, I don't know. I mean, when she went out with me, the first time we went out, I knew I was going to marry. I just, I just knew it. And, uh, and, but I don't know if she was, you know, in her mind saying, he's the guy for me, or if I had to, had to make that happen. You know, it's, it costs a lot of money to own a wife, but it's worth it in the end. <laughs> it takes more money to disown a wife. I, understand. <laughs> well, all right. I don't want to, I don't want to find yeah, out. Yeah, no, you, oh God, you know, and I took my phone off the hook. I'm this talking is crazy to making. Vicky. Oh, uh, you know, and I took, all right, wait. Oh, what Vicky doesn't know is that phone call. You know, <laughs> all right, wait a minute. Now I'm unplugged. This just pisses me off. Now I lost my things because I was all prepared and you know, it doesn't work. Oh, it's God. Fine. Here, you know, look, and I'm in audience, my look. shirt. And now I got to put it in the front. This really pisses me off because, you know, I do the technology thing and then it screws with me anyway. Every time. Every time. Every time. So, um, did you enjoy do stuff together in school? Did you pr perform together? Uh, oh yeah, in school we did some some scenes together, but mostly in the early seventies. Joy went to school in uh, in Pennsylvania, and she was part of the founding a member of a of a basically a, a non equity theater summer theater program. Uh huh. So, uh, and she helped, and then it became a, a really terrific, uh, just the summer theater. What, what program is that? What it was called, program? it was, it's a St. Vincent uh, Theater. It's at St. Vincent College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. We got married there. We have dear friends there. I mean, and that's, that's when my father died, I, I needed someplace to go. And she said, come with me. And I, and I went to her theater and uh, stayed there off and on for, you know, gazillion years, you know, doing plays and, and things that I would probably never be cast at in, in the real world. But I got So to, can you give us an example of what something like that, Stuart? Well, at that age, uh, um, Callie's Folly, uh, All the King's Men, um, uh, Born Yesterday, uh, Day and the Death of Joe Egg, uh, you know, Moliere, a couple of, a bunch of Moliere's, things that, you know, eventually I might've been cast out if I'd stayed in the theater, but at that time, you know, not, nobody knew me. So, but the people who ran the theater, you know, got to know me, know me and they did these, it wasn't typical summer theater fair. It wasn't Natalie Needs a 90 or Under the Yum Yum Tree. We did, <laughs> you, you know, All the King's Men, that ain't, that ain't, they ain't yeah. go away. These are, the, and Moliere, uh, and they did Moliere for, you know, a, a lot. I mean, some guy came up to the director and said, I love that. I love that Mr. Tooth. We did Tartoos. I love that Mr. Tooth. <laughs> but we did a lot of terrific, terrific shows and uh, imaginary invalid. It was just, it was, you know, it seems pedantic to say a learning experience. It was, but mostly it became deep inside me because it was fun to do, working with some wonderful people who became and still are dear friends over you know, over the years, 40, 50 years. Did anybody else from that company go on to have a career? In public, well, there's an actor named Greg Thorne who worked mm -hmm. in Alabama and uh, recently at the uh, San Diego Shakespeare Festival. He became a professional actor. Greg Lan Lana Hagen, uh, who, is, uh, who worked there, a terrific actor. These are both good actors. He's running a theater company in Florida. So they might not be in the public eye, but they're, That's doing, okay. they're doing what they love. If it, and, uh, this is what I wanted to say to you, Stuart. You, I, I you really have lived, a, have, have had a career that I dreamt of having when I was a college thespian, because you've done so much theater, which was my love, and so much theater. But you've also crossed over, and you've done screens big and small, and gotten to do, and then can go back and do more theater, and come back and do more film. To me, that is, you are a working actor who has never stopped. You've, you've, did you, did you ever have to have a job job? You know, uh, I'm embarrassed or happy to say no. I worked in an office. Wow. I, I, you know how in New York, you, you have to audition for a typing job. You go in there. <laughs> so they gave me a typing job. They, and then I got a job, a theater job, and I quit. They were so happy to see me go. They, you know, as I was out the door, they were pointing at some of my work and says, why did, really? Why did you do this? What made you think that this would, 
gone, <laughs> out. And I was happy to go and they were thrilled to have me go. <laughs> so, okay, so when you were at Columbia and you knew this is the path you, you knew before, but that's when you really got serious about the path you wanted to take. What did your, what did your dream, what, what did it look like to you in your mind's eye? What did you want then? Wow. Uh, I knew- did you want to be a movie star? What did you want? No, no. no. As a matter of fact, the old, the old, thing that goes through my mind is when you're in theater in New York or wherever you are, you know, there's a lot of great mm -hmm. theaters around the country. You say, how do I get to Hollywood? How do I get to that mansion and those pools and those cars? And then when you're in Hollywood, whether you have or not, you say, how can I get back to the theater? How can I get back to doing what I really love? And what you said is, is true. I was lucky enough to be able to go from, from uh, film stuff back to doing plays with joy you know, mm -hmm. over the years. But as far as movies start, no, no. I just knew that I, I wanted to go to Columbia. And, other, and people, a lot of people maybe even today would say, why did you, why did you go to graduate school? Why don't you just get out there? Get out, you know, put yourself no. out there. Well, my, my answer to that is you need the technical uh, uh, skills. Expertise, yes. You need the yes. skills with voice and movement and sword fighting and, and all that stuff. You can't just go out there. So many people go out there and yeah, they're, they're, some of them are successful, but they're not going to do, you know, Hamlet. They're not going to do. Right. You did a lot of classical theater. Well, not, yeah, a lot. I carried a spear, you know, <laughs> literally carried a spear uh, in, in the Shakespeare Festival for a while. But yeah, so I went to graduate school thinking that, uh, that that's the thing to do. I think in my day, back in the 1830s, that was the thing. <laughs> that was the thing to do to get, to get ahead. In Colombia, God bless them, they're wonderful people. They never really gave us many, uh, in, much information about the real world. Okay, so were, were, you, were students in your class, were you allowed to audition outside of Colombia? Were kids are doing that or no? Was everybody staying in the program? Well, I don't know, but I, I don't think we were not allowed to, mm -hmm. to do that. I don't know if other kids, I, I think when I was at Colombia- <laughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Uh, when I was Columbia, oh boy, I'm having a hard time today. Thank you. Is it me? Because I can leave. I no, I'm, I'm having an but allergic. I am anyway. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. Uh, yes, I'm allergic to you, Stuart. Mickey is uh, allergic to me. <laughs> through the through the through the, the thing. Through the, so you didn't have time. I I'm sure you were busy. Well, in I'm trying to think of the when I was at Columbia in the summer. I worked at the Shakespeare Festival. I, I did audition, uh, and that, that's what I did. And I think I did. One or two off, 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 <laughs> you know, down in the village. Uh, so I guess people, we were, we weren't told not to audition. No. Uh, I think they probably, if they were really smart, encourage it to get some some practical experience. So now, but, when you were when you were at Columbia, did you? I assume did you audition for plays there? Did you get what you? Or was it all study? Was it? Well, there's there were, a great theater at, at Columbia. Well, we were, we weren't in the in the main campus. We were okay. at uh, Miles Cooper down on 100th Street. Uh, ah. It was an old hospital that they transformed into. And we did plays. I mean, they, we did plays mostly, as I recall, a long time ago. There were scenes we were assigned scenes or directors who were studying directing in the program ask for certain actors to do their scenes or do their mm -hmm. plays. And the third year at Columbia was uh, we did a play instead of writing a thesis. They said you can write a thesis and be done with it, or spend another year and do a uh, and do an original play. So um, uh, uh, that's that's what Joy and I and a bunch of other people decided to do. Isaiah Sheffer, who ran the 92nd Street Y in New York, uh -huh. a wonderful producer, he ran that thesis program, and we eventually did write a thesis. We had to write a thesis based on our experiences. But that, that was definitely a play. But during the course of Columbia, yeah, we did plays and little scenes and, and uh, lots, of, lots of stuff, which was kind of fun because it was all different. Okay, so I interrupted your answer to my question. What was the dream? When you were starting out, what, what to you was going to be, what trajectory did you want to take? Theater, just to be a working uh, theater actor. Uh, it, it, never, it never really went beyond that. The, so the there was bit. no there was no Hollywood in your brain at that time. No, that whole concept of you know going to Hollywood and then how do you get back to New York happened later. You know, it happens when when you get it. Uh, but I, I think, to be honest with you, if I can remember, the, the thing that went through my mind is, you know, 
and these are the places I went, you know, Shakespeare Festival, that's great. Lincoln Center, I did a year there. This is what you did, Off-Broadway, American Place Theater. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do, to do theater. Uh, did I want to be a, 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 you know, a stage star? I, I don't even think that, that entered my mind. I just enjoyed working. You know, that's why I like St. Vincent Theater so much. I just enjoyed working. No, nobody's going to come in from, you know, Paris and say, oh, you're going to go to, you know, <laughs> we're going to put you on the, on the French state. No, I mean, you just enjoy working. You do it for the, for the love. And if you're good at it and lucky enough, something might happen from that. If you go, I, I don't know, I, I'm no philosopher, but if you go into it thinking, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take this town by the tail. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably you're going to get bit by the other end. <laughs> right. So how, so how did it, how did it turn into money? How did it start? How did you start earning money? Um, uh, well, sorry about money. I was, a, like I said, I'm carrying a spirit to Shakespeare's Festival so I did it for two years. Yeah. And, and then I was making like $85 a week. And I, I guess they had to make me equity the second year. I don't know if they wanted to, but they looked at my record. Yeah, in those days, once you do it once you, and you do it twice, you got to be equity. So my salary was bumped from 85 to 135 dollars. I never saw that much money. 135 dollars a week was was astounding. Wow. Then I did. Are you sure you're interested in all this? I then, am. Then I did uh, um, the original New York production of uh, of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor. Yes. Yeah. Where, where was that first presented? That was Brooklyn Academy of Music. It wow. was the first production. Now, there are many other productions that went on. One went to Broadway. We were going to go to Broadway, but that's a whole other story for another interview. But that, that uh, um, led to the... I don't know. That's a pretty good story. We might want to hear that story. Why didn't it... Why, so you were almost Broadway bound. Why, why didn't Clyde it? Clyde Barnes loved it in England. Frank Dunlop was the original director wonderful director. He ran the Young Vic, he, you know, mm. he, Pino in, in Broadway. It's a terrific, reputable director. Clyde Barnes loved it in England. So Frank, you know, said, let's, we'll go bring it to New York. There are two reasons. When it opened in New York, Clyde Barnes gave it a mediocre, tepid review. And wow. Frank Dunlop went to him and says, Clive, why did you do that? You love the show and this is a better show. Uh -huh. he says, well, I just, he's talking about Weber and Lloyd Weber and Andrew Lloyd, you know, Tim Weber. And he said, well, I think the boys need a little come a little come up with. I think we need oh. to Yeah. And the other thing, that that was that was horrible. And the other thing was that Frank wanted the the Brooklyn Boys Choir to do Joseph. You know Joseph at all. It has these beautiful young kids singing in the background. Well, he wanted them to do that and, and they wouldn't let him do it. Maybe the money, maybe uh, mm -hmm. I don't know why. So those reasons and maybe others that I don't know of kept that show from going. We rehearsed at the, uh, at the, at the uh, Mark Hellinger, I think. We actually rehearsed, Tim, uh, one of those guys, the ones that's not dead, came, Andrew Lloyd Webber came. <laughs> the to, one that's not dead. Yeah, he came, Andrew Lloyd Webber came to hear a rehearsal. You know, uh -huh. probably, wow. probably talk, to, talk to, to Frank about it. So we were all set and would have loved it. I mean, it was, uh, it was my wife says it's one of the, the nicest, best shows she's ever seen. It was a terrific show. Simple, uh, you know, see, subsequent productions, you got look, maybe there's more money in it. They put more money into it, better costumes. But, but that first production with Cleavon Little and mm. David James Kelly, I mean, and so many wonderful people. Uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was fabulous. And that got me the Millican show because Frank directed, you know what the Millican show is? Mm -mm. I will tell you, the Millican show was the, at the time, the biggest, uh, in not infomercial. What's what's the word um, when you sell a product? What's the word when you? Inf well, that's an infomercial, it's isn't it? A, but no, no. But it's a, it's a. Oh God, help me! It's it. They had no other advertising but the Millican show. Millican Fabric was a huge uh, company down south, and uh -huh. all they did in you know for two weeks a year was fly all these people up to uh, up to New York, put them in the Waldorf Astoria, and did the Millican show. Uh, for years and years, and they hired every dancer in New York. The wonderful thing about that, the, they paid a very nice salary. I mean, more money, talk about money. I mean, it was like, I'd never seen that much money. I think it was in the thousands. And then they give you bonuses at the end. They loved- And the what time. was the show? The show was, <laughs> the show was Rene Aubergenois, Madeline Sokol. Wow. Uh, oh no, it, go, it goes on. And Gloria Swanson and- uh, Oh and, my gosh. Uh, and, and who's the dancer? And- 
and ranking? No, no, older. Oh, the movie star dancer, George uh, Harry Blackstone Jr. and Miller and Miller. These there were it went on and on and on these actors, and it was a strung together silly uh, mystery murder mystery, and every once in a while. It gave the people a chance to throw dirt on clothing, you know, because they made Millican fabric and then they put them in and then they washed it off or it had something to do with the Millican fabric. And they made the clothes and these dancers got to keep their clothes. They used to have lunch on the weekends at Sardi's uh, for the entire company. And at the end of this fabulous food thing, they had takeout bags. They said, take the food. We told you to take the food. It was a great experience. And the most money that I had made on the, st on the stage at the time. From the Millican show, I wish I could remember more of these actors. They were, they were great. Renee was who became a dear, dear friend of mm. mine. Uh, 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 unbelievable actor. Uh, the Millican show led to uh, auditioning for, Joseph led to auditioning for uh, the San Pedro Beach Bums, which was Aaron Spelling's first and last attempt at an hour long. And I got that because of Joseph. I mean, that was Graziella Danielle, was the, uh, who was a, uh, an, a very well-known fan. She's a Lifetime Achievement Award winner. Bro. She, she fought for me. The musical guy said to me, well, you're not a real singer. I, I said, well, you tell me. And Grazi said, excuse me, comedy trumps singing at this point. I want him in a show, you know, which was nice. And then this musical guy, the bragging man, came back to me, you know, weeks later and said, where have you been? You actually sing pretty good. Yes, you do. Well, thank you. But, but the point is, that show, Joseph, was... Uh, um, was a, another turning point that got me that got me out to California to do to do the San Pedro Bones. Okay, and so from that, I'm assuming soon after had to be not necessarily the news. What was there more in between? Oh yeah, yeah, a lot of unemployment, uh, <laughs> a, a, a few guest spots. I came out in '77 to do that show. Not necessarily the news happened in '82. Oh yeah, so you had a while. There was a while, and like I said, a lot of unemployment, a lot of cashing checks, trying to get jobs, auditioning. Did you have an agent, Stuart? Yes. How did you get an agent? <laughs> the, I got an agent through Joseph. I mean, and he and he submitted me for the San Pedro Beach Bums. He wasn't. I won't mention his name. wasn't a great agent because he wasn't a Hollywood agent. He wasn't a, a California. He was a New York agent. Ah. We didn't know what he was doing, mm -hmm. but he got me out there. And he submitted me, I guess, for some things. I guess he had an office in, on, on each coast. And I just struggled a, a little bit for uh, two, what, 77, seven years, whatever it is. And Joy was also a working actor. No, Joy, no. Joy worked in the East. She was never, uh, she never had a big career in, uh, in, uh, in California. Although she did an episode of Twilight Zone and we just got a dollar twenty three residual. Thank you. I very. love that. I love yes. that. And I'm very proud of that. <laughs> but yeah, Joy was, Joy, Joy, you know, just sort of, she was, we just hang, hung out together and, 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 cause there was a lot of, you know, a lot of us time, a lot of 24 seven. Hi, honey. Good morning. Good, evening, good night, honey. <laughs> and so through those lean years, you still didn't have to get a job job though. You still hung in there, took your unemployment, did the little, the right, little, right. yeah, exactly. And unemployment was, it was a lifesaver because things didn't cost that much in those days, you know, so that kept us going. I don't, you know, and, uh, and Joy in New York, Joy, to get us through, she worked, you know, temp job, secretary job, and she kept us going uh, when, when things were lean. And I'm I glad you talked about New York because I, I went past it and I have to go back because I sure. live just a few blocks from Columbia oh. um, in Morningside uh, Gardens on 123rd between Broadway and Amsterdam. So, okay, so you lived in that. Where did you live when you went to Columbia? I lived with my parents. I lived down uh, in Lincoln Center, 100, uh, 150 West End Avenue, right near Lincoln Center. I mean, I used to walk to work when I was working in the center for that year. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and so, okay, so we have to talk about that neighborhood. You know, George Carlin, the special's out now, but George Carlin lived right around the corner from me, um, oh. uh, right up there. Uh, so did you have like favorite pizza, favorite bagels, all that stuff from the neighborhood? Come on. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we were across the street from a restaurant called the V&T. Oh God, of course, V and T. Well, there you go. There you go, my brother. <laughs> my brother. Yeah, G great pizza. We ate there all the time. We also, we, what do we call it? Uh, we had a name for sabrettes for the little hot dog things on oh, the Oh, sure. Corner. 
so we, we had we had some nickname where you gonna you know we used to say you know sa brett's or s rats whatever it was we so we ate there a lot and as i mentioned before but not to the world there was a restaurant a hungarian restaurant might have been called the Hungarian the restaurant. Hungary, right next, the Hungarian pastry shop on the, yeah, right next to yeah, the yeah. Yeah. And we, we <laughs> ate there a lot. I, I, I mentioned before that uh, the first time I, I, I ate brains. I had brains and eggs. And maybe the last time. Okay. Yeah, no, it was at fine. the Hungarian lunch, pastry shop, you yes. had brains? Brains and eggs. Yes, they had a they had a, a I guess a lunch that had brains. And I I got so smart. After you know, <laughs> now, wait, are brain sweet breads or is that another part of no, the sweet anatomy? breads? Is the thyroid? Oh, that's the thyroid. I like my, that. I can't, I don't know if I've loved, ever had brains. My dad loved the uh, sweet breads, but yeah, brains. I don't think I've had them again. I've had some strange <laughs> things in my in my life, but uh, yeah, brains and sweet breads. Ah, the good old days. Okay, so okay, so going back, so so you're on unemployment, you're getting some work. How did not necessarily the news come about? I assume there was an audition. Well, that's a complicated question. You ready? Okay. You know, sit down, have a cup of coffee, turn on <laughs> your phone. Have some water. Here we go. When I auditioned for the San Pedro Beach Bums, an actor was auditioning. He was an actor at the time called Michael Jacobs. Michael Jacobs became a very po- important producer. In, you know, Boy Meets World, Boy Boy Meets Girl. Uh, he he d- he did a lot of shows. He was doing a a a series called No Soap Radio. With Bill Dana. I loved No Soap Radio. <laughs> you are you are now my favorite viewer. Yeah, I love No Soap Radio. I did too. It was really yes. interesting. It was a little ahead of its time. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And but he said to, to to the producers, "I'm getting." He remembered me from the San Pedro Beach Bums audition, and he said, "I'm going to get that guy in." I was a kid. I was you know, so I auditioned. I guess I auditioned, and I got the job. No Soap Radio. One of the co-writers was Ron Richards. Okay. Ron Richards was, became a writer for not necessarily the news. So I met him by chance at a screening. And he said, we've just done the pilot for not necessarily. And I said, what? And he said, it's a cable show. I said, what's cable? <laughs> no, I mean, literally, there was, there was literally, pardon the expression, 29% penetration in, in the country with cable. And that's not including pay cable, like, like not HBO or Showtime or whatever was around at the time. I said, he said, do you want to audition for one of the actors just left? And uh, I said, yeah. This was after the pilot? Yeah, uh, they had shot something. I think it was the pilot. I don't know if they aired it or not. I don't know. I I went in and I auditioned for Not Necessarily News and uh, and got it. And uh, thank the Lord I did because, you know, it was, like I said, it's a life, it was a life changing thing. It started out, it started out guerrilla you know, television. We used to, the first dressing room, we worked in the Simi Valley. If anybody knows where that is, it's way out in the boondocks. Our first dressing room was the men's room in the Shell Station <laughs> near where we were shooting. Seriously. That's where the chair was. And, and Nancy Severinsen was our location manager. Doc Stone, he said, try to buy gas from them so they don't take us out. This is true. The girls, the girls were, were changing clothes behind car doors, you know, and eating on the rocks and brushing the snakes away. It was, it was really, you know, I remember once having a five o'clock in the morning call, putting it 12, having another call at five o'clock the next day, coming back to that location. I said to the producer, uh, Pat, I can't do this. I just, I, I, you know, it's gone. I'm going to get sick. Then it got better. Then we got some sort of a, a trailer that we all shared, makeup, hair and costumes, actors, you know, and the, and the hours became a little better. And then as the show got more popular, you know, it became more fun to do. When I used to talk about it in the old days, I said, I'm doing this show, going to you know, if you want to watch it, go ahead. But, <laughs> but then it became, you know, when it became more popular, it became a, a much more fun and gratifying to do. But that's the way that started, you know, and it was in the time when the National Cable Television Association was was fairly strong. They were really trying to, 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 to bring names into it. I mean, I, I, you know, and some of the people that I competed with for Ace Awards was Frank Sinatra. Uh, Billy Crystal, wow. uh, Penny Rogers, John Leguizamo, you know, and plus, you know, and, and uh, James Earl Jones, Art Carney. These were all people that were doing cable. Shelley, Shelley, uh, who was in I'm Home, who was that woman that in, uh, in Good Night? Anyway, big, you know, they, they were, they were, 
they were trying to get and you and won they, what you were nominated I, many I, times and you won I, too. I nominated I not nominated five times I won one beating James Earl Jones and Art Carney. Wow. I, I mean I think I, I think I ruined their lives. I think they quit the business. They were just so disappointed not getting that award. <laughs> Yeah, but that's icing on the cake. You know, that, that kind of stuff is, I, I mean, I, I enjoyed it. And, uh, and they treated you very nicely. The Cable Association treated everybody, everybody really nicely in those days because they wanted to be an entity. They wanted to, 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 to be in the game. They wanted to have a, a horse in the race. Uh, and they did. And then eventually, you know. HBO it, was so ahead of its time back then. So daring, so pioneering that not necessarily the news was as well. And right. What was so interesting about it was that you guys merged the real news. It was unlike Weekend Update and other shows because you merged real news with your, they intersected. Right. Right. Well, yeah, it was it was very clever and fairly honorable. And I'll tell you why. We never put, like some shows, they put words in the mouths of the of the people that they're filming. They put in words in Reagan. Or right. We never did that. Huh. They used to get the ABC news feeds, mm -hmm. which was, you know, hours of stuff that people never see. And they used to pick stuff that, that they thought were funny and make sketches of them. So I'd be talking or Annie would be talking, or Mitch would be talking to, you know, Reagan Kissinger, uh, Queen, whatever. But we never put words in their mouths. So whatever they said, the writers would write responses to them. And the other nice thing about not to lose is that we could, it was fairly open, but we never used bad words. We never relied on nudity. I mean, we just kept it. I, I, I'm not going to say it's a family and show. And you probably we, could at that time because it yeah. was HBO. You could, That's what I'm right? saying. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah, we had, the, we had the, the leave to do it, but, but we didn't do it. They didn't feel the need to do that. They wanted to stick with the comedy and the politics. You know, and uh, it was, again, wonderful to go to work. And, and those, like I said, those people... Danny Breen, who, who has passed away. Great Danny Breen, Mitch Lawrence, Danny Bloom. Um, Rich Lucy Hall. Uh, Rich um, Hall. Rich oh Hall. my God, that's where he started. I'm sure that's where Lauren must have plucked him from, no? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we never really liked Rich, so we never talked to him. No, that's true. <laughs> but he, he did keep pretty much to himself. He wrote his own bits and he performed his own bits. And that's that, what I wanted to ask you. Did you write on that show as well? I like to say we, we tinkered. We, we tinkered. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think that they they wouldn't yell at us for tinkering as long as we filmed it the, the original way, and then we we filmed it you know with the tinkering way. But no, um, uh, I, I especially those long speeches or, or you know introductions. I mean, you people. you were the anchor. You were the guy. I was the guy. I was Bob Charles, the anchor, and I didn't know that. Plus, plus happily doing a lot of different character stuff. But yeah, it was, uh, you know, people sometimes they seem to say, Bob, no. <laughs> well, it was, it was a really wonderful show. It had a very long duration. I was one of the people that had HBO back in the 70s. And, and you. yeah, and uh, thanks to my mother, I think I first got started on it, but it was, it was revolutionary. I mean, there were no commercials. No. Uh, you know, it was it, cable was uh, was brand new. It was new. it was the prairie of, of the <laughs> prairie days. Of it was. I mean, it was so new. So, so how did that translate for you? Because I know it was a niche audience. As I mean, as it went on, more and more people were getting HBO, and more and more people right. were seeing it. Um, were you, but you were doing other things while you were doing, were you also doing, you were doing other things, were you doing theater simultaneously? I see. I don't know if I was doing theater. Did well, you yeah. do what? In summer, did yes, in the summer we did go down back a few times, two or three times to do plays in, in, in Pennsylvania. Yes, we did that because there was a writer's strike, a big writer's strike in 85. Mm. And we we just went back and, and I think I did most of the, most of the Pittsburgh, the Pennsylvania season there. So yeah, I guess I was doing, Stuff I don't know what we did when we were off. I don't remember. You know, I'd have to look at dates. But you were you were making coin. You were do you were you were doing okay. I was doing okay. I was doing okay. Mm -hmm. Not Greg Harrison's money, but I was doing okay. <laughs> yeah. Well. Well. And so how did so you didn't stay for the full duration of the show though? Didn't you leave before it ended? Yes. We went from eighty two to eighty to eighty eight. I got a job on a pilot with uh, Eric Idle and the wonderful Caroline McWilliams 
We called nearly departed. So I gave my notice in 88. Uh, at that time, was they, that a hard decision to do to go do a pilot? I mean, it's Eric Idle, but still. No, I, I think as much as I loved it, it's, you know, it's, it was time to move on. It was time to, yeah. you know, to do something different. Um, uh, but, at the, but then after I left, Chris Albrecht, who was one of the, mm -hmm. the monkey monks at HBO, decided to change the show. And he got rid of, of, of the old cast. So I'm kind of, it was lucky for me that I, wow, you know, and they, and they, and they got Annabelle Gerwich and, uh, and Tom Clark. Oh, Annabelle, you know Annabelle Gerwich was here in my living room. Yeah. Yeah. She's uh, a nice lady. And Tom Parks and I became very good friends. I never so watched they, the show with that cast. I don't know that. Well, why would you? They suck. Why yeah. would I? They, you weren't there. But they went on for, they went on for two. We actually went back. The old cast went back. To do a guest spot on, on their on their show, but that show lasted about two seasons. I, you know, not not necessarily the news was. It's not like a season. It's not like twenty two. Sometimes we did eight. Sometimes we did ten. Sometimes we did four specials a year. So it was all over the place. But right. But, but that's my history. Was eighty two to eighty eight. And so then what happened? Eighty eight. Wow. I, I I don't know. I'm assuming. Like I said, I have to look at. It. I mean, your IMDb, IMDb is just on and on and on and on, and a lot and a lot of regular series, and and all you, you did uh, like you did like things like Falcon's Crest and Knots Landing, and and things yes. that I would not think of you necessarily as being. Yeah, I mean that was that was like the more drama than uh, than uh, than I'd done before, so that was great. Yeah, I did stuff like that. I guess I did guest spots and recurring roles from '88 until now i mean i don't know you know i really well, well, well how did um um uh fatal attraction ha i mean that was that's a big move you're you that's a movie yeah. star role how did that happen well that was adrian Lyon. god bless his soul um they were shooting in new york and i was doing not necessarily the news at the time they were mm -hmm. shooting in new york and, and adrian Lyon wanted me to do this role so i auditioned for him and the producers who later we became friendly uh, said, well, get somebody in New York. I mean, why you have to fly this actor in? And Adrian Lyon said, no, I want him. I, and, and maybe it was because he wanted somebody that he knew could be funny or it, it softened Michael Douglas's character. He wanted mm -hmm. to show that Michael had a, 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 a sillier or a lighter, a lighter friend, side mm -hmm. so that, mm -hmm. that he could, so that the audience would seeing this, this, this person is in, in infidel, you know, he would they, he would at least have the uh, a relationship with somebody that was friendly. So to offer was, some humanity to his character. Yeah. Thank you. You're much mm -hmm. smarter, yeah. and eloquent than I. No. So I ended up I ended up once a week for a month flying back and forth from L.A. to New York to do a day in New York or maybe two days and then flying back to not the news and fly. I did that once. I was the See, red you eye. were going back and forth. <laughs> yes, I was. I was. You no. Know? Uh, but that, that's how that happened. And, uh, and again, I cannot be more grateful to, to Mr. Lyon for, uh, for fighting for me. And so what was that like to have that sort of on-screen intimate relationship with Michael Douglas? How was he to work with? Great. I mean, he, he, he's great. I mean, they very smartly, when, when, my, when Ann Archer and Michael and me and my wife, who is, oh dear God, she's a singer now, wonderful lady. They sent us out to lunch together so we could just, you know, get to know each other. And we mm -hmm. did. But the working relationship was was always extremely positive. There's a lots of, uh, like in the dinner scene, there's a lot of improvisation going on and a lot of- Oh, really? Around. Yeah. And, uh, and Adrian, God bless him, let it, let it stay in because he knew that it would, it would help. It was, it was sort of natural the way that stuff happened. I remember in a bowling alley scene, Michael jumped on me. You know, I didn't know that was going to happen. You know, so he was, a, he was a great guy. And he also, a few months later, he was doing a pilot uh, a competition. Uh, whose line is it anyway thing? I mean, there was a, you know, right. story, and he was doing a pilot competing comedy teams. And he called me and Rhea Perlman, who was very good friends with, and to come in and be the panel. So I, I'm, you know, I, I, apparently we got along okay because he didn't hate me. That's lovely. You also did a film with a with a good friend of mine that I adore, Hollywood Nights, with Robert Wall, Robert. who, um, oh God. So w where was that in the scheme of things? Was that before? I can't even remember when that 
Which was I, first? I, 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 I don't think, know. I think Fatal Attraction was first. Uh, I, I, like I said, if you go on, I, I, you have to look at dates. I don't remember the. the Doesn't order. matter. But that, I, I guess, I auditioned for that too. And mm -hmm. uh, Michelle Pfeiffer, come on! I mean, all these people that, uh, you know. Uh, and it was interesting because it took place. The entire movie took place on one night, so it was all night shooting. So you know, you finished, mm -hmm. you wrapped at three or whatever it was for you go back home you try to sleep because i was younger and i could take the take the pain and then you showed <laughs> up at the, you showed up at seven or eight you know and then you and then you did the the, the movie for uh, for the entire night it was, was great it fun did you guys yeah. have fun on that set I, I remember having fun sandy helper you know sandy's a he's an actor comic he and i are still friends uh yeah uh there were some lovely people i still i'm facebook friends with a lot of the actors on the show uh yeah it was uh it was fascinating it was you know old cars and 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 pretty girls and ruggedly handsome men it was all you know it was all fun uh and and you know anything you ask me about it you're gonna basically get it was fun because i can't think of very many things i did that that were, you know, oh, geez, I wish I had never done that. I mean, that's, that's just but, so now was, could drama, were drama sets as fun as comedy sets? Were they different? Or are they They're, different? Yeah, different. They're fun different ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get, you get as an actor, you get, well, you know, in theater, you get, the rehearsal is, 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 the, the, the training ground it's the it's the prairie as you said it's the it's where you where you discover things and whether it's comedy or drama the discoveries are what makes it fun what makes mm -hmm. it exciting and then you get in front of an audience which is why actors love theater because it's an actor's media film is a director and editor's media uh and you get on there and every time you discover something new you know you you, you pack it away and the next night you come so it grows whether it's drama or comedy Drama sets can be really fun. I mean, lots of times I've talked to people <clears throat> who've done real serious stuff and they laugh all the time because maybe it breaks the tension. They, have, they need something to break the tension. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's different, but fun. DBF. Okay, so was striptease fun? What was that, what was that like? That was, <laughs> that was beyond fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, striptease. Striptease was, uh, uh, you know, it's fun. It was a big production. You know, the, I, I worked on a few big, big productions. That was one of them. I mean, Demi Moore had 12 trailers and she worked Oh, out. my God. I don't, I don't know. I met her once. I, didn't, I never really worked with her. Armand Asante, I did work with. Terrific, interesting man. Um, mm. Yeah, it, it was great. We, the producers you, took us to strip clubs. Before the film, before the shooting, just so we could, because I'd never been to a strip club. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> but that's the truth. So we went there, and I met, and I came, became very friendly with a couple actors. One of them was Paul Guilfoyle, who's in the movie. You might know who he is. Yes. Uh -huh. Good actor. And we played golf. I just started to play golf. So we used to go out and, and play golf and hit, hit golf balls. But the, the movie was great. Ving Rames. Thing we're having lots of wow. Yeah, right. I forgot about him. He played her bodyguard, didn't he? he played her yeah. bodyguard, and, and, I, and I was his lawyer. So yeah, it was all, it was all great. Florida was fine. I never really spent a lot of time in Florida. We filmed a scene in the morgue, in the real Miami morgue, uh, and uh, because I, I ended up, I ended up being dead in the movie. So and Armando Santi, you know, was, you know, trying to figure out why. But we were in the actual morgue, and eventually people who were in the beginning a little reticent to let us wander around, got a lot leaner and leaner. We saw things there that, uh, that uh, you know, I'd never seen before, you know, and including police investigations with dead bodies. And I had crab, I was eaten by crabs and uh, in the movie. And the, uh, the, one of the morticians said, what is that? And I said, well, it's supposed to be crabs. I'm eaten by crabs. He said, come with me. I don't want to denigrate the makeup people. So we went to the freezer. And, and we saw and we saw a body that was indeed in the ocean for a while, eaten by by things. And oh, it was, quite, it was quite different than my my little my makeup. Anyway, it was a very it's a fascinating experience, and uh, and uh, again, loving it. Robert Patrick was in that movie. We went. I, oh, I, I love him. Oh, he's he's great. He's great. And uh, we actually went to a movie together in the beginning. Then he became now he became a huge you know star. And I, I I'm a big fan of his.
But anyway, it was, it was, and it's a good movie. You know, it, it people, I think might, might've confused it or with, uh, what was the other one that came out at the time? There with, was that horrible one with the girls taking it off. I can't remember right. what it was. That's it. it. Was, people, that was awful. That right. one. And people might've been conflating those, those two. So striptease didn't get necessarily uh, the traction that, that it might've. But I thought it was a good movie. And I, I like I said- Showgirls I, was the other show one. Girls, Showgirls, yeah. yeah. To me, you know, to me is a good actress. To me- she, I think she is. Yeah. And she really prepares. Wow. The body, I remember her going on Letterman when she was doing that role and she did a dance on his desk and her body was like, oh my. God. Well, I'm not kidding when I say that she had a, a, a any number of trailers and one of them was a complete workout gym. I so bet. she would work out, you know, at, uh, during lunch. She wanted to stay in- Top shape. Uh, she's a good she, actress too. Yes, I, th I think so too. <coughs> um, so, uh, so how Rick Moranis and Honey, Honey, I shrunk. Uh, yeah, Honey, we shrunk ourselves. ourselves. <laughs> honey, we shrunk the kids. Honey, we blew up the kid, and then Honey, we shrunk ourselves. So was that was that fun? I mean, are you looking at green screens the whole? Day? Is it fun? What what what's that like? What do you think my answer is going to be? I had to. Yes. Be fun. Of course, yes. it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was a lot of green screen, some oversized props, and uh, great. Again, look it up. You got a computer handy? Look up how many showmen of the cast because there was about four of us, including Allison uh, Mack, who eventually became kind of she ran into a little bit of uh, Soros uh, later. Uh -oh. uh, but uh, but um, yeah, Rick. I had done a movie called Big Bully with him, did a, a, a small part in that, you know. Uh, and Eve, then, go oh, Eve Gordon, I know Eve. Eve Gordon, Eve Gordon, Eve Gordon. Okay. great. And and you looking at the cast? Yeah. Look at my wife, Robin, Robin, come on. Ro uh, Robin Bar Bartlett. Robin Bartlett. Wonderful ladies, we all got along so well. We spent, you know, 24-7, whatever we did with the movie together. Uh, everybody got along great. Rick was, as he says, he says there's a lot of responsibility when you're number number one on the call sheet, and he 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 came up to that to that challenge. I mean, he ran uh, a wonderful ship, and he was he, he's great. He's funny. He's wonderful and admirable because after that, his wife died much too young, mm -hmm. and he gave up the business to take to go back and take care of his kids. Wow. He's just now starting to, to get back in the business but he really he, he made a decision that's it i'm taking care of my kids you wow. can't you can't praise a man high enough for that that's wow yeah plus the fact that he's he's a funny guy and a good actor and he's a nice guy too son of a bitch he's got everything <laughs> so what about doing heart and arachnophobia what it now is is that like again you're doing green screens what's that like no no no, no arachnophobia <laughs> Ratnophobia was uh, no greasy. They used, you know, real spiders, except for the, the, the big spider at the end, which was animatronic. But they were New Zealand spiders, and I think they cost $1,100 a piece. You know, they were big. They were like, you know, that. In fact, one day on the set, they asked us all to come, you know, on set and let the spiders crawl on us so that if perchance you're on the set and you see something, you go, ah, boom, $1,100 <laughs> down the tubes. So we had to let them crawl all over it's just to get used to him john goodman i remember him he was just it was like a dance he was letting these spiders crawl wow all over. yeah and it was great and they were really they were real spiders and they controlled them by hair dryers you know basically they put air and they they had them go where they were going to go it was it was great it's a good movie arachnophobia is a good movie Jeff i Daniels. would watch that again i'm gonna see if that's streaming i i loved it the first time i saw it yeah i liked it too i thought i thought everybody did a terrific job roy brocksmith Kathy Kenny, who was, uh, you know, another wonderful comedy actor, mm -hmm. actually wrote a song for the uh, for the trailer. I wrote a song and they used it for the trailer. How so, fabulous. Yeah, it was great. Well, like I, I, I told you, I do that. I write songs. I know. So how did that start for you? Like, where did that come from? Song parodies? Yeah. Oh, my God. Here's ready for this? Yeah. Hanukkah is a joyous time to praise the Maccabees. They fought off all the Philistines and set the Jews all free. I'll give my thanks to the Maccabees. They deserve it. They sure do. 
I'll give my thanks to the Maccabees and I know you will too. That's like seven, six or seven years old. That was one of my early, my early song parodies. Um, I'm impressed. Well, there. And of course you remember it because we remember those things. Oh, yeah. Um, Best work I've done. So, but you've had your stuff get used. What's this thing that you did for Cinemax with the hump of, um, you did a parody, a Shakespearean parody, right? Yeah. Yeah, written by Larry uh, David, uh, Larry uh, Arnstein and David Hurwitz, who were writers on Not Necessarily the News. And I guess I had lost the Mace Award, and, and, and John Moffat, our producer, maybe felt sorry for me, says, you want to do Cinemax Comedy Experiment? We're basically, it was, a, it was a decent but small amount of money for a comic to get up and do a job. We decided to do a, to do a play. So these guys wrote a play. When I was doing uh, Richard III in, in the park, carrying a spear and understanding <laughs> I wrote song parodies for that, uh, for Richard III. Kevin Klein, who also carried a spear. Get out comic. of here, you you started with Kevin Klein. Oh yeah, Kevin Klein, Jimmy Keach was there. Kevin oh, played the piano, God. so when we were on a break, he would accompany me as I would sing these, I'm Edward, I'm Clarence, <laughs> I'm Richard III, that your kid win the war alone is really it. So this whole, and I wrote a bunch of these parody songs. So when we decided to do, Kevin actually was, was in a sense responsible for getting my first agent in New York because we were at oh, a party. He, we were at a party uh, and he said, come on, sing your song. And I said, I can't sing this, that's for us. So sing the song. So I had a drink and I never drink. So I, he played the song, I sang, you know, whatever, can curses, pierce the clouds, can, whatever I sang. Jeff Hunter, who was a pretty good agent in New York, came up and said, you want, you want representation? I said, sure. <laughs> yeah. So wow. that, that's the way that happened. But that the reason that we came up with Hump, Richard III, was because I had some songs in the trunk that we, we could pull out and, and, and do it. And then the guys, Larry and David, wrote the, uh, wrote the script. And we did it in two days. I mean, I played five parts and had, again, it was, Joy and I went, I went over those lines every night in the, in the living room, just to, you know, because I had to play five parts and there was no time, you know, Jesus. one you know, but it was it was it was great. I mean, you know, if if when you're young enough and strong enough, you know, and a little bit ambitious enough to want to do that, it's not work. You know, right? Work is laying bricks. Right. And this kind of stuff is is a joy. So yeah, that's how that's how Hump uh, came to be. Speaking of Larry David, uh, you've done Curb, uh, you've a very Jewy part. Uh, was it, was it, <laughs> uh, okay, so what I've been told by a number of friends who have been on the set is that you get basically an outline of where you have to go and then you kind of speak your own work. Was that true? What was your experience on that show? Yeah, it was, uh, they're very protective of these outlines that you, you know, you, you talk to the ADA, I said, what's this about? You kind of had an idea. I knew I was a head of a, of a, of a, um, an organization that gave kidneys out to the needy and Larry wanted one for Richard, uh, Richard, come on. Lewis. Richard Lewis. Uh, so I knew that. And then basically I said, can I see what it's about? He said, they'd rather not let you know. So you get on the set, which was a restaurant and they kind of tell you what needs to be said. You gotta, you gotta say you like the Yankees. You gotta say, some of them something can up. You gotta say you like skiing. You gotta talk about your wife. You gotta see your man. I said, okay. And he comes in and he starts and you sort of follow his lead trying to get this stuff in. So I'm making it up, I'm saying, so Vicky, you know, when I went to, a, to Boston the other day, I said, cut, so you can't really say Boston because it's not, it doesn't track with the script. Okay, action. So Vicky, when I went to Philadelphia and I went into this uh, delicate test, cut, can't say delicate test. Now this is all made up, but that's basically right. What if you say uh, something that doesn't track with the story and only he knows the story, wow. you know, you cut it and, you, and then you, he, he give you some, some clues as to what you need to say. You gotta say the Yankees, you gotta say skiing because it ended up in a ski lodge. And so that's the way that worked. And it was- uh, Is that uh, intimidating when you know that at any moment they might say cut because you've said some, like, are you thinking about what you're saying rather than being in the moment? Uh, that's a great question. I I'm going to say no. <laughs> okay. I'm going to say that I'm going to I'm going to be in the moment, uh, and I I can't remember really thinking about I'm thinking about what I have to say. Because yeah. I'm just thinking that if they're yelling "cut" like a bunch of times, that that might be prohibitive to creativity. I don't know. Well, you know, some that's an interesting that's an interesting point. It might it might have worked on me or an actor. You know, I guess when if you're Jeff Garland or Richard Lewis and you do it enough. You know, it becomes second nature to them. But the guest people, right? It's 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 a different way of working. 
But, how, how does it feel to be a guest coming into that show with this well-oiled machine of these people that have been doing this together for so long? Do, are, are you invited in as part of the family or do you feel like you're on the outside stepping in? Well, I, I don't know if you're part of the family, although Jeff and, and, uh, and Larry and, and his wife, were, they were very nice to us. Mm -hmm. I was there with my daughters, did a great job. Uh, um, I don't, you're not an outsider because, you know, of necessity, they need you to, to be comfortable in that, in that right. world, or else it's not going to work. Family, you know, we're going to go out to dinner and talk about, uh, you know, personal problems. No, <laughs> but over the course of the shooting, it was, it was very comfortable and you get used to it, you know, like in the, in the first scene in the restaurant, it was a little, maybe you're right. It was a little, I'm thinking about it too much, but then as it went on and we shot the other scenes, it was a lot easier. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. Just curious about that. And so you've also worked with Mel Brooks, which uh, <laughs> Mel Brooks, Mel Brooks. That, you know, that guy, that guy. Jane so, <laughs> and so what was it like being on the set with Mel? Well, the, the, I worked with Mr. Brooks three times, twice as an, an actor, once as an actor, twice as an actor, and once as a, a producer. And in, in Oh, the, as a producer? Well, he wow. produced a movie called The Vagrant, which was a very interesting, Bill- I Bill saw that Paxton. movie. Yeah, it, it, Bill Paxton, God rest his soul, was, uh, was in it, he was mm -hmm. great. Uh, but he, his Brooks films produced that. But the one I did with him was, um, life stinks no that's not it yes it oh, is that's yeah it. it is life stinks yeah. and he had his plate full he was producer he was director he was a writer uh and he did it all yeah. and on one of the hottest season parts of the season in the summer in la at the time oh wow uh, and he was you know i hear i heard that he could have a temper so never and not with me anyway. Sometimes he goes after his friends because he's known them. Like Howard Marsh, he's known since in, since in vitro. So, you know, they, they, they have an unspoken language. But for, for the guest people, uh, I'll just talk about myself. Jeff Tambor was in it and uh, some wonderful people. No, it was, it was despite his, the pressures that were on him, you know, to, do, to get this project done, he was, he was sweet as pie, sweet as pie. I've met him a lot of times, I mean, and one time he was sweet as pie, and one time he wasn't. I wanted to run away, but that's you know, Mel could be, Mel could be. Well, the thing that I I, I tell him is that when I was in high school, before the uh, junior high school, whatever, before the auditorium collapsed, mm -hmm. the first uh, thing uh, I did in a variety show was a two thousand year old man. I just remember uh, and did it. Hello there, here we are. When you are, and, I'm, and I told him, I said, you, you, you. You started me. You were my first. You were my first theft. I stole your your material. Wow. <laughs> Carl, Carl published my book. I love oh, Carl wow. very much. Yeah, yeah, a sweetheart. So I used to see them. I would come down. I was doing my audio book in Carl's pool house, and I would come into the house, and they'd be sitting, Mel and Carl, watching TV with little TV trays, eating their dinner, and Mel would be complaining about the lamb chops, and it was just very surreal. But uh, then he quizzed me on his son. That was the time he was me. He was very sweet the first time I met him, but Max, that time, right? he quiz, yes, he quizzed me on Max, and I wasn't Max educated, and he did not like that. That was not okay. But um, they really, but, you know, they and. Max Bancroft and, and, and Mel apparently made professional choices to be with Max mm -hmm. uh, throughout his life. I mean, they probably gave up work, you know, just so they could be with their son. Again, admirable. And if you so, think Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks, geez, I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. No, it doesn't get much better or much funnier. Um, it doesn't get much funnier or much better. So now let's go back to the stage for a minute. So you have gone back to the stage over and over and over again. And once you've been a television actor, a movie, a, a film actor, and you go back to the stage, I would imagine it's different um, because now you have a recognition factor when you go, when you step out on the stage, right? People know who you are. Come on, people know who you are. Well, they might, but, but it's not like you get entrance applause every time you step on the stage. <laughs> I mean, I work a lot at the Santa Monica Playhouse, at least I did over the years. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, you just step out, you do your job, you take the makeup off, you go home. I mean, there's nothing like, who oh, can I have your autograph? No, there's very little of that. Mm -hmm. In New York, when, when things were, were 
cooking a little bit, people would recognize me and ask me for stuff. But in LA, you know, it's a little no, more- LA, everybody's too cool for the room in LA. I don't care yeah. who you are. That's right, that's exactly it. So as far as re recognition mm -hmm. on, on the stage, uh, I, it's, you know, that's, that's not been my experience. I mean, uh, I draw, I mean, I just concentrate on the work. You know, if they say you did a nice job. So what is it like as an actor to, to make your Broadway debut? I never made a Broadway debut. Yes, I thought you did. I thought you did Shakespeare on Broadway. I thought, or didn't you do The Crucible on Broadway? What did you, the you Crucible, did some... Yes, The Crucible. Now you're lying to me here. Uh, if I could get away with it, I will, but I can't because the Lord will strike me. No, well, I worked at Lincoln Center for a year as a journeyman. They consider that Broadway. Okay, uh, I do. I kind of do too. Well, it, it kind of is. It isn't a Broadway contract. It's a Lord contract, but it is in that realm of, yes. of, of, of place because the people obviously that they get at Lincoln Center were, you know, they're, they're magnificent. Yes. Actors. Yeah, I did four shows there, uh, including The Crucible and understudied uh, a lot of parts. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had classes, I believe, you know, for journeymen. They had, you know, silly classes, which, you know, didn't make a lot of difference to any of us. But the understudying was interesting. I understudied, you remember Michael Dunn, the little person, Michael Dunn? That name's very familiar. He was in me. Wild Wild West. You're too young for that, but. No, I'm was, not, but yeah, okay. He was, he was, he calls himself a dwarf, but nowadays you call him little people. Right. I, under, I understudied him twice, once what? in the park and then once in Lincoln Center. Yeah, it was it was interesting, and then he died in the, during the Lincoln Center run, uh, and then somebody maybe even before we opened, so somebody uh, took over for him. But uh, you know, the understudying was was kind of the interesting thing about that because you know you you play small parts and you walk on, hello my lord, and then you walk <laughs> off again. But the understudying, you got to work out your chops a little bit. Wow, what's it? What was it like? Uh, what's it like doing Shakespeare in the Park? And and I've gone many times as an audience member. But what is it like to? Because there's so much just potential distraction. Yeah, uh, um, I've never <clears throat> really thought about the distraction as far as the actor, as far as the audience. I, I don't think they were distracted. I mean, they, they, I'm not the audience. I'm talking about as an actor. If all of a sudden you're delivering and the plane is going up or a siren is going by, does it distract you? No, I don't. No? Think that, I don't. I don't remember a lot of a lot of uh, that type of distraction. Uh, they used to, you know, throw rocks down at us from the <laughs> castle up on the hill in the backstage, but that's about it. I mean, I, I don't remember a lot of plane problems. I remember a lot of microphone problems, mm. people taking their microphones into the bathroom. Or if it would start to rain, did it ever start to rain? You know, I don't remember if it oh. ever rained. I don't remember. One thing that I do remember about the Shakespeare Festival was that we did we did Richard, Henry VI parts one and two and Richard III. Mm -hmm. So Pat decided to do them all in one evening as a fundraiser. Uh, what? And, yeah. It was it was murder. I mean, and it was fun. How many hours of theater? Well, it's, it's nine hours of theater, let alone let alone you know what's between. Stop. Them. Right, right. Stop and go. But we he did it. We did it, and it was. Uh, I remember the sun came up. They were talking about distraction. The sun came up. They were going to and and the paparazzi were lining the in front of the audience. And the audience were going, get the hell down, get down. We were here all, you know, they were here all night. These guys come in, take pictures. Then the cast of hair came in and sang, let the sun shine in. Oh, uh, wow. And it was, it was quite the, it was quite the memorable uh, um, evening. You know, never forget it. I will never forget it. I actually saw hair in, at, at, in the park with my kids. Took the, 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 I saw the original on Broadway, but then took my kids to see it in the park, the, the next go round. Well, you really, you're into theater, huh? I, well, yeah, because that's, yeah. Hello, New I York, you. Jew, I, actress. I don't blame you. I don't blame yeah. you, man. It's the, it's the way So, okay, so speaking of that, so tell, tell us before we go, some of your favorite actors to work on stage with, some of your favorite roles to do, and is there anything that you've yet to do that you'd still love to sink your teeth into? Not sinking my teeth into not in the old days it was Cyrano I wanted I've always wanted to do Cyrano mm -hmm. I know we did the sword fight you know Lancelot and his lady hall in, in, in Columbia we did that we choreographed that I've always wanted to do that now I'm a little <laughs> I'm a little beyond that uh, 
but there's nothing that I can think about that I really want to do. Because you've done so much. Okay, so tell me some of the fa- so, tell me some of your favorite roles that you've played that have well, really been well, mostly you. theater. I mean, they, yeah, they, uh, yeah, of course. They, well, I mentioned some of them: Day and Death of Joe A. Uh, and Brian, uh, Born Yesterday. A lot of these are with my wife, so they were. Mm. Uh, uh, Lend me a tenor. We did that twice. Imaginary Invalid, Tartuffe. I mean, there's a. The, the, but those are back in the day. I'm talking about more. Recent. Yeah, more recent stuff that you've done. Well, recently, recently, uh, I was doing, like I said, doing plays at, uh, at the Santa Monica Playhouse, uh, written by, uh, well, it doesn't matter who wrote them, but uh, those were those were not as fun for me as 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 the old stuff. I know that's disappointing to you, but but no, it, the old stuff. I get you, it. You know, and as far as tele- as far as film, I'm always going to be grateful to Fatal Attraction. Because mm-hmm. uh, I had a good time, not the, necessarily the news. The, these were, you know, favorite things because it was not only the writing was good, but the people were great. Mm-hmm. And that 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 makes a big difference. I wish I could tell you uh, that I we, I just finished a movie during the pandemic, before the pandemic, called uh, Deep in the Forest. Okay. Uh, which is gonna is out now on VOD, Video on Demand. You probably know more about that than I do. Comcast Spectrum. It's not on on the pay. It's not on the Netflix or HBO. But you can get it. If you're a member of Spectrum, you can get it somehow. I will be in a few weeks. I'm not yet. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. Um, but that's that's the most recent thing that we did. Okay, that so let's talk before. about let's talk about how the pandemic. I I was telling you, Stuart, before we came on the air, that the people who watch the show are sort of the COVID crazies. I was going live seven days a week during <coughs> the first year wow. plus of the pandemic because I had nothing else to do, and neither did my people out there. So how did what were you doing? When the lights went out, as I said, were you in the middle of something? Uh, did it did it disrupt your life? What, what, where were you guys at? No, we were we were lucky enough, uh, you know, not to. I know this sounds strange, but not to be working. I mean, so we didn't have to disrupt our lives. My uh-huh. kids, my my wife and my uh, son and his wife, were lucky enough to work from home, so they have jobs that they can work from home. So that didn't affect them. So that really took the pressure off me, you know, emotionally and physically. Uh, during the pandemic, my God, we stayed, we stayed home, you know, 24 seven, like everybody else. What happened, which was lucky is that some friends in Hawaii, Mark Beltzman and, uh, and did a uh, play uh, written for Zoom. He wrote a play, St. Mary's Immaculate Conception Reunion. It was about, it was a murder mystery. And every, every night there was a different murder. He wrote different endings. So he wrote that play for Zoom. And wow. that kept us, that kept a lot of us, certainly kept me going through many months of the pandemic because we did it. People actually paid to, to watch it and the money went to, the, to a, a theater in Hawaii to fund that. But that was, uh, we did that a lot. Wow. We, first thing, we filmed it and it was a lifesaver uh, being able to look forward to that. I played a priest. It was a character role. <laughs> And and did you guys play by because I did you play by the rules? Did you stay home? I, you were saying you stayed home at the beginning, but like I still haven't reimmersed in life. I still haven't been to a movie. I haven't been to an event. I haven't flown. Have you done all that stuff? Not a movie, not an event. We flew, you know, about a year ago to North Carolina to see some family. Uh, that's it. We were nervous about it. Uh, I was going to say, how was that? And, and it was, it was a little bit nerve wracking. We, mm-hmm. we got, we got as many shots as we could. My kids are out of town going to weddings now. And, you know, until they get home safe, it, it makes, it makes you nervous. But during the pandemic, we, we did, we, we, we played by the rules. We, we stayed home watching a lot of crap television. There was some good television though, too. Binged, I've binged a lot of good things. Like what? Like what? Um, oh God, you pick, I, I binge like every, well, I just re-binged The Sopranos, which held up brilliantly. And I'm re-binging now uh, Six Feet Under, but there's a lot of new stuff. I, I like Hacks. I'm Lorraine Newman's daughter, Hannah Einbinder is in it. And I think her and Jean Smart are wonderful. But but The Fall with uh, um, Gillian Anderson and, and a, a lot of dark stuff. Uh, Happy wow. Family, I... I, I you know, you're catching me off guard. I've binged a ton of stuff and I've really, I'm going to send you a list afterwards. I have okay. a list and I really found some great stuff over the Joy, Joy and I watch a lot of the British <coughs> cozy mysteries and, and I've been watching things like the Borges and, 
and the Medicis, and there was a thing about Vikings called Last Kingdom. This is recent stuff okay. that I, I really like. You might not. It's it's pretty. It's pretty. You know, it's violent. There, I love I love dark. There's a documentary called The Staircase about the true guy, and then there's the 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 the, the HBO version with Colin Firth that's going on. Uh, but the documentary on Netflix was fascinating. That's great. Of uh, course, you send me those links. We've been watching recently. Our kids, our kids told us to watch Severance, which was a series on. I we tried one episode of that. I didn't like. I it. did too. Let me tell you something. Years ago, they said watch The Wire, and I said okay. We watched. I saw one episode of that. Let me tell you something. I watched one episode. Joy and I said, I can't. We can't do this too. And the kids said, please, please stick with it. Turned out to be the best television show on television and this is just not my just, this is this is what everybody tells me well, i couldn't you, understand a word I, I need subtitles with it i know believe me we do that we call it we call it bbc if you put on the subtitles even if it's yes a- absolutely did you watch ted lasso no i saw one couldn't, couldn't all right couldn't watch ted lasso force myself to stick with it let me tell you one of the most worthy experiences i've really? ever had watching television See? it gets so deep you can't go by that first episode. I'm telling you, it no, gets I understand. so deep. I understand because the same thing with Wire and the same thing with Severance. We turned Severance off and the kids said, please yeah. watch it. Now okay. it's, it's dark. If you like dark. I love dark. Then you should watch, stick with Severance, get through that first episode and then and then let me know. All right, I'm going to go back. But I'm telling you the same thing. I know thing you don't want to do it. Te- I'm telling you, Ted Lasso, I, I fought it, fought it, fought it. And wow, All right. I just Those loved it you, so because of you, I'm um, going to revisit. Give, give it another try. Give it's one more try. it's very, the, the humanity of it gets pretty amazing. Um, so do you guys go to restaurants? Yes. Do you eat uh-huh. inside? Yes. See, I haven't done this yet. So you're, very, you're braver than I am. I'm a little braver. Uh, um, of course, we're, as you probably are, we're like vaxxed and boosted. So. Oh, God, yeah. I've had my third boost. Third? Well, maybe I should look into that. Yep. I got my second boost in in September. So after six months, if you're over 65. You I can get a third, third boost. I can get a third boost. Yep. Well, I'm only 43, but I, I, I can wait. You can. <laughs> you'll have to wait a few years, but then you can get the third. You have to wait a few years, then you can get the third boost. <laughs> oh, my God. But, you know, so before this is the last, I promise. So. I'm Paul wrong. Williams was Paul Williams was supposed to be here tonight, and he double booked, and he's a friend, and he's done my living room. He's lovely, and you said that okay, Gary Marshall, one of my favorite people on the planet, did my living room when his book came out. He, the ladies in the kitchen, he was. I love Gary, and you did Happy Days live at the Falcon Theater. Yes. Yeah, three three versions of it, three different casts. He wow. did it three times. And then over uh, what over what year span? Probably a year and a half, maybe two. I, I may be exaggerating. It might have been. It might have been. And, and back about fifteen years ago or so. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he and then he he found a cast he liked. He didn't want me apparently, and he and he took it out. You know, and he and he sort of ran the country. He wasn't really successful because it's hard. He struggled really hard to get that show to work as a, as a, as a theater piece. I can't imagine it as a theater piece. Well, there you go. There you go. The second version, Paul Williams and Carol King did the music and lyrics. What? Yes. Yes. And that was just being in the room with those two. Oh Paul my Williams. gosh. Paul Williams, Carol King. I mean, you look at these people, but that's Paul Williams. It's Carol King. <laughs> you know, it was I just- I can't imagine a, them collaborating. That's well, interesting. Well, you know something? It's been it's been a long time. I don't even know if I, except for being in it, heard or remember the music. You could probably get it somewhere. You know, wow. if you're if you're friends with Gary Marshall and you know his family, I'm sure they'll give you. You know, well, I, Gary, but yeah, not his. I don't know. I've only met his daughter once, and, and I don't know his family either. But yeah, Paul, she was again, again. Carol King was actually very nice to me. I, again, remember I told you Graciela Danielle, the choreographer, and Joseph. Mm-hmm. The, the voice guy didn't want me and she said comedy trumps singing well the same thing happened with miss, miss king i was doing something in a in a choreograph m- number and i did something which i always do i just do stuff and the choreographer said no it's not going to work and carol king says excuse me comedy trumps choreography and let so and i've never those two examples in my life i've never forgotten 
that those people had my back and, you know, and I'll always be grateful to her. Besides, they're, you know, they're legends, they're icons, they're... Oh, phenomenal. So exciting. Stuart, how do you learn lines? Of, how I don't know. I mean, I know back in the day, memorization was something that I could do. How do you do it now? How do you learn lines? Well, you know, the fact is I don't have to learn a lot of lines. A lot of things that I do, like these podcasts and stuff, you, you, you read the scripts. Uh, but the interesting thing about learning, the more you do it, like not necessarily the news, when you started the season or maybe mm-hmm. even in the series, you get these pages of, you know, hi, this is Bob Charles and we're going to go to Croatia. And it was like, oh my God, toward the end of the season, you get 15 pages of heavy material. You learn it in two hours. I mean, the brain wow. does something to you. And I'm used to, you know, we in, in, in stock, summer theater. I was going to say, when you're doing theater. Well, you do the play at night. You know, you rehearse during the day. Right. You do the play, another play at night. And then you come mm-hmm. back to your room because you don't mess around and you learn that day's work. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, Joy always says, you, you always, you're always hard on yourself because I always learn them, mm-hmm. but I'm nervous about it. And, you know, and it's, and most actors would say the learning line is not the favorite thing in the world. You know, if you had long, rehear- you know, in summer stock or summer theater, you know, maybe a week and a half to, mm-hmm. to, to do it. If you're wor- working on a Broadway show, and you do it over and over again, you know, you, you, the lines come to you. Joy is, is amazing. I'm not. I, I, maybe, I, maybe I am, but I don't believe in myself. So I have to struggle. I, you know, I, I learn the lines. I, I, you know, I take a shower. I get in the bed with the script. I learn them just before I go to bed so that it'll stick with me. And that's the way it was for years. How do you learn? So you, you did... You, I don't anymore. I, I do talk shows, so I don't have to learn anything. I can just talk. So w- when you did some work during the pandemic, so what was that like? Uh, you have three projects coming out, I see on IMDb, or you have two that came out and one is about to come out. Uh, oh, you have something oh. in post-production. Oh, uh, uh, what is it? Do you, have, do you have the name of it? All right, wait, I'm going to your IMDb so I can do this. Well, Deep in the Forest, we did, and that's out. That's out. Okay, so then you have Kickback coming out. Kickback Pre- oh, you're in pre-production. Happening. Yeah, Kickback is not is not happening. It probably won't happen. Okay, but you have Pilot Season. Well, that that's yes. Neil Gordon is a producer writer that that I work with. I, I you know his daughter Victoria, and that family does small small films. So I do do that you know with him. But the other movie that's interesting. Uh, is it's Marion Hartley and her husband Jerry Sroka did a an autobiographical movie. Our almost our almost perfect. It, it might be there. Our almost accurate life story. And it was basically they wrote a movie about Marriott and Jerry and how they met. And they asked all their friends. Yes, our movie. almost completely true story. Yes, I see that. That's it. And that that they've been shopping that around to festivals, and I think they've been very successful. I have a I have a wonderful little scene, but a little scene in it. And, uh, and she asked all her friends to come in and do bits and pieces in it. And that hopefully will come out sometime, you know, soon. I think I've actually interviewed a few people that are also in that film. So did you, um, did, were you on set? Was it COVID friend? How did they handle that? It wasn't, I think it was before COVID. Oh, because okay. I don't remember masks. We were outside the set that mm-hmm. I was, we're outside. I don't think it, so that would have made it what? Late? It says 2022 on IMDb, but that's not okay. accurate. But that's okay. that, that's you know that's when maybe it's being released. No, I don't remember any COVID uh, issues. I don't remember wearing masks. We just you know showed up, did the stuff, and went home. But that's so now, problem. if you got called tomorrow to come in and do uh, a guest spot on a series, and you're going to go, are are you still nervous about? Did you get? Have you had COVID? No. Me either. Yeah. So, so are you still a little, or are you not anxious about it anymore? I'm, it, I'm not anxious if, if, as I've heard they do on sets, follow COVID protocol, mm-hmm. you know, keep people, make sure to test them. Some people, you know, they test them every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that I'm boosted. So I would go in with a mask. I would be wary, not nervous, you know, uh, and I wouldn't do it if I was nervous because then it would affect the work. And I don't, want, I don't want to be looking over my shoulder at somebody sneezing when you're trying to work. But I, I would do I had one job during the pandemic that uh, it was a voiceover. And I mm-hmm. went into a studio and they had it cleaned and bags over the microphone and bags over the, you know, they, they really cleaned it. And the people were, uh, I never saw another person. 
but that's the only thing that I did out. And they said to me, are you okay with that? I said, yeah, yeah, and I, and I was. We didn't even talk about, all, you've done so much voiceover work and Dinosaurs, Emmy, Emmy winning show. And is that fun for you? I, that has to be fun to do voiceover work, I would think. I always, well, voiceover work, cartoons and dinosaurs are different. Well, you know, cartoons, as you know, you get in a room with a bunch of very funny, talented people and you do the script and then they animate you. Dinosaurs, the Henson people did the, did the script, moving the mouths of the puppets and you had to go back in the studio and replace the, the voices of the puppeteer. My oh. puppeteer was, he's a little English guy, talk like this, hello, honey, I'm home. Oh, look at those dinosaurs. Well, they didn't want that. They wanted Earl to do that. So that's, that we had to do that. And it was, it was, a little frustrating because you had mm. you were relegated to the, to the movements, but eventually you got used to it. They got used to me, and uh, it was a job I used to say in the beginning. I loved having it and didn't really enjoy doing it because you're in a mm. studio for eight hours, and uh, and you have to make sure that everything syncs up. You got to try to get your creativity into the ma- into the puppeteer's creativity so that it all works. But yeah, I mean, dinosaurs again, another great. Thing. And now that it's been released on Disney Plus, people really are revisiting and re- reintroducing themselves to dinosaurs. So that's cool. Very cool. So, all right. So, real life question. So, I for one want to go see Top Gun because I I hate those kind of movies, but I've heard it's phenomenal. But I don't want to go to the movie theater. Would you go? Have you gone to the movie theater? No, no, no. I don't think I don't think I will do that yet, especially with this new stuff coming out. I, my I son just got it from a concert. Your son got COVID? For the first time, yes. He oh, just he went to a concert, no mask, got COVID. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I, I, I am. It's, it's a, it's he's not. doing fine. He actually had a very mild case. He was all boosted and everything. Very mild case. And he's negative now and he's okay. Yeah, and he maybe, works yeah. from home, so it was okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not ready to go to a movie. I'm yeah. not ready to go to a play. I've had friends who were nervous people. And they've gone to places and so they sit there with masks. I can't, I can't, I can't do it. I mean, I'm of a certain age now that that I'm more vulnerable than you younger. Well, so how do you go to a restaurant? How do you do the indoor restaurant no, thing? You know, it's it, it's I, I don't go to a bistro where people are sitting, you know, three feet apart. Right. People are like these Froman's. Do you ever hear Froman's Deli? Of course. Yeah, of course. That's where we go. We meet friends Sunday for brunch. Basically, that's what we do. There's mm-hmm. some restaurants in the Palisades that uh, that we eat outside. We, we do that. Well, outside, yeah, I do that. Yeah, but Froman's is probably the only place that we eat inside. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and that's a, a sacrifice our friends would prefer not to. But I'm not that nervous about it because it's a big space, you know, and people are not, you know, sitting around. Uh, but yeah, they, uh, look, you know, you can't, you got to live your life, as we say in the trade. Well, a lot of people are living as if, most people, it seems, are living as if there's no, as if it doesn't ha- exist anymore. Now that's a it appears. That's a problem. Because I think, uh, from what I know uh, from from the inter- from the interweb and from doctors that I know, uh, it's going to be with us for a long time, if not forever. And there's always going to be strains. The thing about COVID is, and I don't, I'm not a doctor, but I have played one on TV. <laughs> yes, that the more va- the more v- variants there are. Mm-hmm. the weaker they get. I mean, a, a, a virus doesn't exist by dying. It exists mm-hmm. by, by changing. And when mm-hmm. it changes, the, it medically, it gets weaker and weaker. That's why people can have COVID and get very mild symptoms, especially if they're boosted. Right. But, you know, like I, I, like a lot of people, we're gonna, it's going to be with us maybe, you know, once a year of COVID shot, like a flu shot. It's just going to be. That's okay with me, but I want to be able to go back to the movies. I want to be able to go see my friends in their plays. I mean, I, you know, some I, I, I agree with you. It, it's, a, it's a loss. It's a loss. It's not as much of a loss as people who are really suffering, right. you know, for COVID. So I, you got to say to yourself, hey, you know, count yourself lucky. Uh, but yes, I would love to, and, mo- and a great many people would love to reintroduce themselves into the normalcy of their own lives. Absolutely. So are you working, are you constantly doing like the Zoom, are, are you doing stuff moving forward? No, not really. Mm-hmm. So not how really. are you feeling, your, how are you enjoying your time? Um, I've been, I've been, believe it or not, I've been going, taking an ex- going through exercise programs. I swim two or three times a week at the Y and I, and I just signed up for, for a, uh, it's called a slow motion, high intensity weightlifting program. 
which I recommend, which is really great. So I've been doing that. Uh, you. On the days that I'm not doing anything, I just kick around the house, you know. Uh, I love it. And, uh, and if I'm lucky enough to talk to wonderful people like you, I'll do that. I mean, I've done a lot of podcasts for this Deep in the Forest movie that's coming out. I mean, they had a publicist, so they set up a lot of podcasts. So that, that, that takes some time. And happy to do it. So Deep in the Forest, we can see on Spectrum or? VOD, they call it. Video on demand. Okay. Right? Whatever that is. And I don't know what that is. <laughs> Okay. You know, I, I really you just don't. have to do it. You don't have to know what it is. I don't have to know what it is. <laughs> we we know there's light. We don't have to know how it gets in the bulb. We I don't know how it. electricity works. What the hell do I care? No, so we don't have to know. Switch. <laughs> Stuart, thank you so much for oh, honey, this it's been so nice to get to know you. And you jumped right in and you're you just have great energy and willingness, and I'm so grateful. Well, you're a pretty terrific interviewer, too. Well, thank you so there, much. There are some like you out there, but not a lot. Thank you so There's no one like me, Stuart. There's no one. <laughs> didn't I say that? I said there's no one like <laughs> That's me. what you said. I, there that's are what imitators. I heard. There are imitators, but there is no equal. <laughs> there you go. Well, I hope one day to meet you in the real world Nothing and right. come see you do your thing. And uh, again, thank you so much for doing this and for jumping in. I'm very grateful. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Ted Lasso. I'm going to, I'm going to, there's a test. Ted Lasso. I'm going to do it. <laughs>